Lewis Hamilton, one of the most successful Formula One drivers ever, stunned the sport recently by announcing that he's changing teams. It's a sport oozing with money, and the top drivers require substantial bankrolling to make it big. So, does running out of cash mean the end of the road for many competitors? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, Lewis Hamilton has won a joint record seven World Drivers' Championship titles. From humble beginnings to racing superstar, Hamilton is the exception to the rule. The Post has sent F1 into overdrive. After an incredible 11 years at Mercedes AMG Petronas F1 team, the time has come for me to start a new chapter in my life, and I will be joining Scuderia Ferrari in 2025. I was surprised, I think. Um, we we all thought that maybe Luis was retiring in, in Mercedes after uh, many years and a lot of success together. Hamilton's going to cry. Wow. I was very surprised, actually. Um, I think everyone was. Didn't see that one coming. Lewis Hamilton is not a typical racing driver. He was the first black person in Formula One when he started competing in 2007. He's from humble beginnings, growing up in Stevenage, 40 miles north of London. His father often worked up to four jobs to finance his son's racing. And it's a very costly sport. Go-karting, which is how most drivers get into it, is about $120,000 a year. Then half a million per season in F4, another million dollars in F3, and three million plus in F2. The current cost cap for F1 is $135 million. At the top level, there is sponsorship, but getting there usually takes significant personal wealth. To help encourage awesome. more people from diverse backgrounds into F1 and motorsport more generally, Hamilton set up a charity. In 2022, he gave away $25 million to deserving causes. With the 2024 F1 season gearing up, all eyes will once again be on Lewis Hamilton and his final year with Mercedes. So will future generations be able to follow in his footsteps? Or will they be left behind? Earlier, I spoke to Giancarlo Minardi, the former owner of the Minardi F1 racing team, and I began by asking him how excited he is about the upcoming season. I'm excited. We're all very curious to see what will happen in the next few days. The season starts in Bahrain. Over these last few days, I have watched the online presentation of all the new cars for the season. It's difficult to make judgments. It's clear that we've come from a four-month stoppage and we're all waiting to start the engines and see what has decreased and by how much. Let's hope it's not a big gap between Red Bull and the other cars. And Giancarlo, in your opinion, why has Lewis Hamilton joined Ferrari? Perhaps you should ask him. I honestly would have made other choices of my own. My DNA leads me to want young people to debut today both in Formula One and at the gates of Formula One and Formula Two to arrive from other formulas. There are many young people who deserve to participate in the Formula One World Championship. So perhaps we have to ask, but it is clear that for a driver to race for Ferrari, especially after having won so much, is something prestigious. And Giancarlo, do you think Lewis Hamilton can beat Max Verstappen and make history? He's already made history. He's already done it. He's already won seven world titles and therefore his history has already been made. It's clear that if he were to win, he would make history. But to win, it's not enough to just be yourself. He also needs a car. He needs a competitive car. If he managed to win with Ferrari, I think he would become an even greater driver in the history of motor racing. Giancarlo, how important is the Netflix TV show Drive to Survive? It is extremely popular. Right now, it has been a big input to Formula One. And at this moment, young people are following our sport a lot because of it. This is important because making a generational change is vital. But honestly, I'm not able to judge how important the hardcore fans are, the people who have kept Formula One alive even in very difficult times. 
The new generations use systems and methods that are modern for me. I'm a bit ancient. I'm a bit historical. I've become old. So I still follow a TV show more willingly than going on social media. And Giancarlo, tell me who's going to win this year's Drivers' Championship. I think the man to beat is still Max Verstappen. He had a huge margin last season. I don't think he won that margin by accident. I'm not even sure we've seen the very best of Verstappen for Red Bull. I believe that at a certain moment, they managed the advantage brilliantly and did what they wanted during the race. I don't know how much the competition has managed to get closer to this extraordinary duo, Verstappen and Red Bull. Giancarlo, thank you so much for your time on Roundtable today. Well, let's meet our guests. We have a fantastic panel for you. Joining us from Madrid is the sports journalist and TV presenter, Christina Gulon. And here with me in the studio is Lars Sexton, a former racing driver. Christina, I want to come to you first. Just tell me, I've been following Drive to Survive on Netflix. It is a wonderful series. Just what has it done for the sport of Formula One? Well, a lot. It has uh, made a huge impact in the world of Formula One, off and on the track. It has given all of us a bigger idea of how this motorsport works. And for example, for the audience, it has been a blast. You have to take into consideration that Netflix did a, an investment of only 5 million to record this. And it has been watched all over the world with an audience of more than 50 countries, 56 in total. So. It has attracted audience, like for example in the US, who has never been that interested in Formula One like ever before. And tell me, Christina, you know, that's a relatively small investment for Netflix, but in terms of the payoff for Formula One, newer audience, rich countries, and younger viewers. Exactly. New audience and the key element is the viewers, not of today, but the viewers of the future. In the last 10, 15 years. Unfortunately, Formula One has like a, a lot of essence, a lot of tradition. So a lot of the traditional viewers of Formula One, like for example, here in the 80s, people used to get up in Spain at five in the morning, seven in the morning, six in the morning to watch the races in uh, um, countries uh, that no longer participate in the championship. Did This has changed. Now they are opening the market to new countries to new cities. We now have three cities in the US to compete. Um, we will have a Grand Prix here in Madrid and wider and wider they're making the audience all over the world spreading out. Lars, how important has it been to tell the human stories behind these amazing machines to get under the skin of the sport and show a global audience via Netflix that there are compelling stories here to follow? Phenomenal. It, it's Liberty Media and Drive to Survive have done something that Formula One hasn't been able to do for many, many years. And they've, as we say, taken the sport to a whole new audience. Um, you do also see the other side of that, you know, recently with Christian Horner and, and all that stuff in the press. You know, is it necessary to be that much at the forefront and do we need to follow that story? But that's what Drive to Survive has done. It's increased the interest. And, you know, every little story now that creaks in the paddock, we all get to know about it. Christina, talk to me about Lewis Hamilton. Why now has he suddenly decided to join Ferrari? Oh, my God. That's the question that all of us are wondering ourselves. Well, it is shocking. It's one of the biggest moves in the history of Formula One. Um, it's been rumored many, many times, especially back in 2023, um, but when Lewis Hamilton renewed his contract with Mercedes, all the rumors disappear. Now, this contract was supposed to cover 2024 and 2025. But what we just found out is that there was a release clause that now Lewis Hamilton has decided to activate. Um, which is something also shocking is the fact that we haven't even started the 2024 championship. So he didn't really have the chance to test the car. The test will start next week in Bahrain. So he's kind of sending the message on the one hand that 
he kind of not trust his team to be able to compete against Red Bull. And on the other side, I wonder, is this a decision that he has made with the head or with the heart? I think kind of both, because despite his career has always been linked to Mercedes, even when, when he was starting in, in karting, he was linked to Mercedes. He has always ran with uh, being in red, like every single driver in history. You want to be part of Ferrari because he's the most awarded uh, team in Formula One. So I think it's a mixture of both. Change at the right moment, also take into consideration that in 2026, the rules for Formula One will change, especially what regards to the power units, and also a matter of the heart to fulfill your dreams when, when you were a child. That's a very good point, Lars, isn't it? I mean, absolutely nobody can ever say no to Ferrari, can they? No. It's, uh, you know, Lewis, <laughs> first and foremost, Lewis is passionate about motorsport and passionate about Formula One. Yes, Ayrton Senna was his idol, but he would have also, Nigel Mansell around that time would have been racing for Ferrari and El Leone, you know, the world was going berserk, especially the Italians about Nigel Mansell driving a Ferrari. And Lewis would have lived through that time now, there's so many other things at play here. So Fred Vasseur, who's now the boss of Ferrari, he ran Lewis in Formula 2 So when he raced for ART. So there's a good, strong relationship there. And when you look at Lewis, he's very, very intelligent about when, he, when and where he moves. He moves to the team at the right time. So Nicky Lauda persuaded him to come and drive for Mercedes a year before a big rule change. And then a year later, he won the World Championship. And the timing now of this Ferrari move, he's moving yet again a year before a big rule change. Lewis has seven world titles. Schumacher holds the record with him equally. Do you think that was a driving factor, you know, to get to eight, nine, maybe ten? What, what I find quite interesting, going back to karting days when Lewis was, was racing cadet karts, he used to run an engine that was tuned by Jensen Button's father called a rocket engine. And he won the British Championship on that. And for no real reason, he changed engine tuners to a guy called Force. And Anthony, Anthony Hamilton, Lewis's dad, said, I just felt like Lewis needed, needed freshening up a little bit. He needed something new. And I wonder whether this is the same. He just needs something new, a new challenge. Christina, the rivalry is wonderful to see between Verstappen and Hamilton. I mean, it's such a a soap opera that plays out every weekend all over the world in very glamorous places. Absolutely. For me, the key thing when we think about the switch of Lewis Hamilton to Ferrari is that will he have a better car that he has nowadays? The question is, okay, if he doesn't have a, a worse car than the current Mercedes, okay, he can compete and he can still push and, and fight against Max Verstappen. They have been bad blood of the track, but they, are the heart, they have the heart of the lion, each single one. So for me, it's more like, okay, this is gonna continue, but I don't know up to the point he will be able to compete with the Ferrari in 2025. Let's see what happens and what kind of car, which kind of performance does he have? Lars, going back to karting, which you mentioned, I want to show our viewers now a picture of you beating Jensen Button, yeah. who went on to become <laughs> Formula One world champion in 2009. How old are you in that photograph? Maybe 12? Uh, 11, yeah, 11, 11 12, yeah. 11. Yeah. So just talk me through, you were absolutely determined to be a Formula One driver. What happened from beating Jensen Button as a child in go-karting? What's the journey and what happened to you? Um, so for me, it, all of our families used to go all the way around the UK every weekend. We would just be like a traveling village, really. We would race in Cumbria, in Scotland, in Dorset, everywhere as a family. Um, and that, that takes a lot of time, a lot of investment, a lot of money. Um, so I raced with Jensen. Generally, out of 10 races, he'd probably beat me seven or eight times. I, you know, there was the odd occasion that I managed to get one over on him, which was, which was good. But him... Anthony Davidson as well, a, a Sky presenter, you know, really good driver. We were all around the same era. Um, unfortunately, though, it comes down to money. So when you're racing, um, back then it was probably £10,000 for a season. Now you're talking probably a quarter of a million pounds just in karting. This is children's go-karting? Yes. A quarter this... of a million pounds a year. Who has that kind of money? 
very, very wealthy people. Um, and that the sport has changed a little bit now. So you will have people spending more than a million pounds in karting before they even go to race cars. So Lewis was fortunate enough to be um, sponsored by Mercedes from the age of 13. And for sure, before he even got out of Formula One, he would have had way more than a million pounds spent on his karting. You spent a year in France. What was that like? You were a, a fully professional racing driver learning a new language. I remember filming you in <laughs> Le Mans. You won, you won in pole. Um, how difficult was it not being able to make the breakthrough to F1? Immensely tough. Um, and sadly, I don't think enough probably is done for people that put their heart and soul on the line. To, and to be able to compete at that level, you have to persuade yourself you're going to make it. And inevitably, I mean, probably only 1% of the population are going to make it. And I struggle personally with a lot of mental health challenges after finishing racing because you can still do it, you just can't afford to do it. Um, mm. So hopefully, there's a lot of stuff going on in motorsport now with inclusivity, with the female, form, you know, trying to get a female Formula One driver. And I hope maybe in the future, there's a little bit more mental health support for drivers that don't get to make it. You went on to test drive for Aston Martin and you now coach young people getting into motorsport? Yes, um, motorsport is my passion, just like it is Lewis and everybody else's. Um, and I can't race anymore, but I get a real buzz out of coaching and mentoring people and giving them the benefit of my knowledge. So I recently passed a Motorsport UK coaching qualification, um, which has been really, really good. So yeah, that, my passion now is helping others achieve their goals. And how happy were you for Jensen when he became world champion? Phenomenal, it's so happy, because Jensen is such a decent, nice guy. His father, bless him, who's no longer with us, John Button, a great character to have around the pits. Now, there were times when we would be racing, and John Button, Jensen's dad, would say to my dad, Jensen has got to win, because if he doesn't, we can't afford the diesel to get home. No way. So they were on wow. the line that much. Well, Christina, Wonderful stories from Lars about a childhood spent in motorsport. I mean, is that an issue for the sport going forward? Accessibility. You know, from what Lars is saying, you need to have very wealthy parents or an extremely wealthy sponsor. Exactly. Formula One is one of the most expensive sports in the world. Like you very well said, either you have a wealthy family behind you or you have really, really good commercial agreements and sponsors that can finance you. Now, we have to take into consideration that together with the amounts that Lars just said, you need to have the FIA super license in order to compete. Now, the minimum to compete the very first time to reach F1 is 10,400 euros. But this amount increases considerably when you become already an F1 driver and you are already competing. So the more points you earn during the championship, the bigger amount you have to pay for your super license to compete the following year. Now, let's take, for example, the, the example of Max Verstappen. He won last year 19 of the 22 races. So that means he has earned 575 points in 2023. Now, for each point, each driver has to pay 2,100 euros. So if you do the maths, he will have to pay in 2024 to compete 1.2 million euros. Otherwise, he won't be able to compete. Luckily for him, Red Bull have already announced that they will cover this. But regarding his teammate, Checo Perez, they haven't pronounced themselves. And the same goes for some other drivers. So either you have a big sponsor or several sponsors behind you, or you have family business that can support you, or unfortunately, you will never make it. It's not just a matter of how talented you are, how far you can get. No, you need to have a sustainable financial support long term. Otherwise, it won't be impossible. So back to the question that you mentioned before regarding the the young people uh, who are now watching Formula One, it's difficult for them to identify themselves with these Formula One superstars because it has always been very, very difficult to get there, but nowadays even more difficult because um, the whole money that Formula One is driving right now, it's going 
crazier and crazier year after year, and especially with the new agreements, such as the one with Netflix, such as uh, the bigger audiences in countries that they were never into Formula One, for example, in the US. So it is a very complicated and most important, a very, very expensive sport to be part of. And Christina, I want to talk about diversity in Formula One as well, motorsport in general. I'm going to read a quote from a head of human resources at one of the F1 teams who says, we do not care about ethnicity. If the guy is a genius and he can make the car go faster, we will hire him. I mean, if you look around the pit lanes, look around the drivers, there's not much diversity. Exactly, there's not a lot of inclusion or diversity. It is true that from FIA, they're trying to send this message that they want to be more inclusive and more diverse, and they try to launch certain initiatives to send this message. But on the other hand, what they do with, uh, for example, races in countries such as Saudi Arabia in Jeddah is exactly the opposite. So one thing is what you are saying, and the other thing is what you are actually doing. Um, also, FIA has always been against different um, supporting actions, such as, for example, I don't know if you remember the Black Lives Matter T-shirts or LGBTQ plus um, T-shirts as well during the Pride Week. So if they really want to be more diverse and more inclusive, they have to take actions, such as, for example, um, give scholarships to minorities who are interested in making a career in motorsports, like, for example, engineering, engineering scholarships, or actually fostering the female competitions who are now on the, let's say, on the three right now. They don't have the support, and they don't have the spotlight on them. So if we really want these to change, we need to do something. They need to do something. Lars, that's a really good point, isn't it? I mean, all the global exposure of Formula One, but when you look at it, it is it wrong to say it's basically a rich white man's sport? Yeah, it is, basically. Um, you know, one thing that we, we must applaud Lewis for, he's been phenomenal in trying to make a change, mm -hmm. and he's done some fantastic work with that. But I, I'll take you back, I don't know what you, you might not know. So many, many years ago, there were two female kart racers, very, very talented on the European stage, Sophie Kumpfen and Lotta Helberg. Sophie Kumpfen is Max Verstappen's mum. Now she, with the right finances, if the same amount of money was spent on her back then that was spent on Lewis, she would have been a very, very, very successful Formula One driver. How far away are we from seeing women get into the sport as well? You know, talk about inclusion, diversity. How far away do you think that might be? Um, for me personally, what's happening, happening at the moment, they're doing loads of series for female racing drivers. Formula One is not like tennis. It's not like you've got a female sport and then the male side of the sport. You've got to go and participate in that one sport. So it's great that there's a load of initiatives for Motorsport UK are teaming up with Team Sport in the UK where females F1 Academy can go and go karting in the UK. Um, but the problem is to get people to Formula One, you have to invest multi, multi millions of pounds in one person. You can't spend all that money on 20 people because you're just diluting the effort. Somebody needs to spend multi millions on one person one female racing driver, then I think we will see somebody break the mould and be really successful in Formula One. Christina, what's your prediction? How long is it going to be until we see a female F1 driver absolutely bossing it alongside Verstappen and Hamilton and everyone else? I wish I could give you a proper answer and say in 2030. But I think it's going to be difficult. Um, for example, in my experience as a, as a journalist in motorsport, when I was at the paddock, there were few female figures there um, in terms of journalists, in terms of engineering, um, mechanics. It was a really, really sad experience in, in this point. When we want to put that into the F1 drivers, I think it's going to be even more complicated. I think maybe we need at least another 15 years you know, in order to be able to actually compete in the paddock with the same conditions. 
And Christina, I'll ask you briefly your prediction. Who will win the Drivers' Championship this year? I wish I could say something different, but I think it's going to be Max Verstappen. And Lars, tell me, who do you think is going to be world champion again? I agree. I think it's going to be Max Verstappen. No chance for Lewis? He's good enough. If they give him the car, he's going to be tail up and he can do it if he's got the car. But sadly, I think, you know, we haven't spoken about Adrian Newey. That guy's won 26 world titles, way more than any of the Formula One drivers. So Max Verstappen in that Red Bull, I think unbeatable again. Lars and Christina, thank you both so much. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. And if you like what you see, please do hit that subscribe button. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, thank you and goodbye.